What is up, down, and sideways, you beautiful individuals? Welcome back. It is League Unlocked. Eric and Mark here with you, beauties, and we riding high into the next round of MSI action with G2. The West coming up with that big upset against TES. Team Liquid's turn to get on the rift with the massive upset against T1, who were a little bit shaky, wishy-washy coming into this series, and we know the APA trash talk was going to be all about this, and I think T1 knew as well, because right from the get-go, game one in this series, both Guma UC and owner just hovering and poking away APO and APA in the mid lane. The guy has no chance to trash talk when he's dying under turret. Even if he was going to feel bold enough to go into the all chat, uh, the game one experience from T1 and the coordinated effort to make it uh, two man, three man, four man dives into the mid lane on APA. Yeah, my brother was not going to be wanting to dive into all chat after this game one experience. Gets the Aurelian Soul, one of the champions we love to see APA on, one of the champions that we might get the Team Liquid win against T1 uh, for didn't look anything like that <laughs> this game one it was very much uh controlled from t1 with slight angles that you had team uh team liquid finding themselves hanging around nipping at the heels of t1 in this game and staying around longer than i think t1 uh would have liked to have entertained from team liquid in the first match and listen years past you have this what was it oh three oh four start on apa he's down like 30 cs Years past, this game is snowballing out of control, and there's a 15k gold lead for T1 by 22 minutes. So, the fact that Team Liquid did find angles to kind of get back and level out this game was a solid sign early on in this series. Yeah, and I think you can look at the bottom lane, talking about Jan and Core JJ finding some angles to get something back for Team Liquid, even someone like APA later on into the game and mid to late, you know, parts of this one, finding a way to pilot that Aurelian soul to find some ways to get that effect. And even if obviously still quite a ways behind of where you needed to be to have that effect that you want to have on that champion in those team fights. Overall, decent showing from Team Liquid in this first one, one of those ones where you felt there was enough in the tank where maybe if you aren't set so far behind, you would have had a chance to make the outcome different in this first game. But with that uh, aggressive early game from T1, the advantages, the early stages, too much from Team Liquid to overcome. But luckily for them, the middle of this series is where the certification comes out for banger status in this set. Game two, a bunch of AD carry bands come in. It's the last pick for Team Liquid, and you see Yon drop in the Samira alongside Nautilus, which is not usually a pairing we see uh, with that Samira. And truthfully, Gorgia J wasn't great on the Nautilus in game two. But the sheer confidence for Jan to pick the Samira and how he piloted it throughout the game because early on and the mid game, this pick got rolling. I, I turned off the stream. I'll be honest, I turned it off after I saw the Samira pick come through. I thought after game one and seeing that there were some angles for Team Liquid to get a little bit more interesting in that matchup, and then to see the Samira locked in, I thought, okay, there's no way this is gonna work. It's gonna go down to that, you know, O2, this series is gonna be done and dusted. I'll review it later. I got thought better of it. I said, you know what? I do at least need to see this. I tuned back in and thankfully I did because yes, Jan makes the Samira pick work for Team Liquid. There's a couple things on the side of Team 1. We got to touch on why it doesn't end up being a victory for Team Liquid, but the Samira pick and the execution on it from Jan and the confidence, as you said, to pick it and run that by T1 and execute on it. you love to see that. That is good progress, something we got to keep track of when we're talking about this run for Team Liquid. And honestly, I mean, this game goes north of 40 minutes and it really comes down to one misplay in the mid lane uh, out of Team Liquid. APA steps a little too far forward. Jan had just burned his flash, so he eventually gets caught out. But Team Liquid was in control. And if they don't make that mistake in the mid lane, then maybe they're carrying that momentum to a game two win. But these are the little things that we're always talking about in the LCS versus the LCK or the LPL is you make one somewhat big mistake like this, that's enough to cost you the entire game. And, and that's clearly what happened. It was a critical moment. It was one, a critical mistake that came through APA. As you mentioned, Jan without the flash in that moment, 
And when you're able to extend out that fight, you're able to follow up on getting down one into the next one in that type of situation, that's where it snowballs. And that's exactly how that fight ended for Team Liquid. But you laid it out. It's an important moment for these young players to experience and to know and to feel that position of actually being in the driver's seat, being in that controlling seat against T1 in that situation. And now they feel that burn of, well, now you felt what it is to be in that control of the series and just how quickly and proactively T1 and these LCK squads can wrestle that control back from you and take it to your nexus. And how about a triple AD carry comp out of T1 with the Callista Calista support and the Vayne mid coming out of Vayus, or Vayne top, excuse me. But I feel like often these comps are hard to kind of pilot when you have such a squishy team comp, but uh, the Vayne doesn't even end up dying. Guma doesn't even end up dying for T1. So masterclass. As dominant as tanks have been and, and kind of the prevalence that we have seen them throughout this meta, if you roll that dice, if you roll that gamble, I'm going, well, we're just going to go all damage. And if you get to the items like LDR, you start shredding those tanks and you got three ADCs doing it? Absolutely. You've got the damage. You've got the speed to turn that around. T1 composition, when you've got someone like Kyria that can comfortably take one of those ADCs in the bottom lane, and of course, Vayne is that option in the top side, you get a composition like this rolling on through. And thankfully for the LCS Team Liquid, they didn't quit. They showed life again in Game 3. Again, it's the same top lane matchup of the vein into Cassante. And you could see the two polarizing play styles impact at times. Just saying, all right, see you later, Vayne. I'm going to go 5v4 with the squad. You get all these solo creeps in the top lane and... Eventually, it continued to work out for Team Liquid as we had another rock-solid performance out of the bot lane. They're getting 2v2 kills against Guma and Kyria. The key thing in this Game 3, as you mentioned, is that 2v2, is that individual performances lining up against the individual performances on the side of T1, factoring in. Then that Team Liquid wanted to play that team game. You have that Cassante grouping up, making it 5v4 when the vein is outside pushing, getting another lane, making all these type of things happen, farming up, getting to that point where she's going to be that raid boss, that damage dealer that you got to respect. It worked out for Team Liquid. They took the gamble that they would be able to push and pressure T1 enough with the advantages they would hold before the vein became the raid boss. And I tell you what, Two, three minutes later, that Vayne was the raid boss in that game. And make and you make a mistake of giving that Vayne the Hex Hex Soul as well? That would have been a real, real embarrassing loss for Team Liquid to run their chances like that. But they absolutely clutch it out on the gamble. APA makes a crucial play into the in the T1 base on that team fight. And it's Team Liquid getting themselves in the series. And listen, there were some. This was the craziest game of the series probably gameplay wise there were some insane back and forth team fights like minute and a half long extended team fights and team liquid to their credit their macro and map control was actually on point this set from pushing that inhib turret after they dive zeus to sneak in a baron that t1 has no idea about how often do you see any team sneak a baron against t1 T1 is the team that yeah. does the desperation Baron calls. They got to be aware of it. Team Liquid sneaks it through this time around. And I got to mention in this game three, again, following that Samira performance, you saw the confidence on Yon and how he piloted that Kalista in this one. This was absolutely not an LCS Kalista. This was a Kalista that showed up on the international stage and delivered out that damage and was dancing around the way that you want that Kalista to be able to move. Honestly, if if Jan plays like he did this, the last couple series, we'd be talking about him in the LCS as one of the best AD carries in the league. So I hope that carries over uh, to the summer split because even with that momentum from game three, I think all you needed to see afterwards was uh, probably the post-game chat that Koma had with the squad because game four, T1 came out looking like different animals we finally see ziggs oh my god it gets through for apa but it's opposite fakers oriana which uh is and always will be much 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 more terrifying there was a cost equation and a cost mistake on the side of team liquid they ran through the equation on how do we get apa the signature champion getting this ziggs making it through the ban phase 
the Orianna as well escapes mm -hmm. the ban phase. And we know that Orianna is that top tier of champion. You have to ban away from Faker because we've seen it from G2. You've seen it from BLG. You ban out Faker, a targeted selection of, of these champions in that mid lane pool, really laying into it. You can find an angle. You can find an, advent, an ad advantage for your team that you've carved out straight from draft onto Summoner's Rift. And that is a tangible advantage that you have for your team. You give over that control, that familiarity, the, the options that are available for some of these champions, specifically one like an Orianna that is gonna not only be fantastic on her own, but make the rest of T1 operate at a fantastic level. That is the big issue and big error from the side of Team Liquid. And the other big problem is going all in on some movement, some dashes, some hops, every little type of, of ability that you've got extra in the, in the cannon and making sure that you get umpty on that Lilia pick that we have talked about that hasn't quite necessarily seen as much action as we would hope to have been banned out quite a lot of times and doesn't really fit into some of these compositions. But they want to rush that Swifty Boots. They want the power of the deer and they forget to ban out Poppy. Poppy, the champion we have seen, Mickey and G2, showcase just how much of a headache she can absolutely be for anybody that wants to have an additional movement on the map. And yeah, look at Team Liquid's composition. That's four, five members that want to be able to have a little bit of extra movement on the map. That's not a good equation to me. Yeah, it's... I mean, Poppy quickly becoming one of the most impactful, if not the most impactful pick at this event, even more than Cassante. Also, Kyria's Orn at one point, I think is level 10, and Core JJ's Rel is level five. He's doubling up his levels. And, and this isn't just like, you know, some other random champion that is, oh, of course. Orn has abilities. He's got the skills to actually take you down with some of these things. A, a two level advantage, three level advantage on that Orn is scary. Five is something else to be reckoning with. That was just the pace that things were going for this T1 lineup uh, in this game for this was without question, the most dominant game that we have seen at this MSI. You can talk about pick Ben all you want, but 27 kills in 23 minutes. T1 was just on a different level in that fourth game. So with that, we say farewell to the LCS at MSI for this year. So now we got to look back and give some type of a grade. And obviously the two NA representatives are going to get very different grades because Team Liquid, you combine the Fnatic series win and a competitive three out of four, at least two of the games in this series plus a win. And you got to, honestly, I know it's sad, but you got to be happy with what Team Liquid put forth, especially you saw the growth of APA and Yawn that you should hope they carry back to the LCS and will again be contenders for Worlds. The problem with being happy about Team Liquid's performance here and understanding it is knowing that, well, you're still showing up to the party with the big hat with loser written on the very front of it. But knowing the font that, yes, is a little bit smaller. You have to squint to see it. <laughs> and we got a, a little special bow and ribbon on it this year because of the performance of Team Liquid, at least showing up, showing this confidence, showing these strategies, and showing growth for APA and Yon specifically is the one thing I want to identify here because if you go back, to what we talked about Team Liquid last year, Worlds, and how that performance went and where we needed to go and where the improvement needed to be for these young players, this is it, more or less. I think you can look at uh, APA individually and understand that one of the big ones was talking about champion pool and maybe that's necessarily not been answered. But as far as, uh, you know, keeping up with Yappa and the cockiness and backing it up with the gameplay, it's been there for him. That has been a, ri a rise up, a level up in, in how he's been able to be a leader in that mid lane. And Yon in the bottom lane. We've already talked about that Samira performance, the Kalista performance. This is someone that is rising up in the charts. Someone that was invisible. Last Worlds, the performance that he was given out for Team Liquid. This was the much needed step up and rise for him. And one of those ones that sets him on that trajectory to be in that top three that we talk about in the LCS to join the likes of a Berserker as one of these juggernaut titans of the bottom lane of the LCS. That Samira, that Kalista, Callista, that is quickly those performances that can put you in that territory. Going against guys like Guma, other world-class AD carries, he's got to come back to the LCS with the utmost confidence, knowing that he can go toe-to-toe -to -toe and compete with these guys. The LCS after that should be easy pickets for him and Team Liquid. But, you know, let's, let's give them a conservative, maybe something like a B 
you know, I don't want to quite go B+, plus, but if you give them a B, then you're giving FlyQuest, I was going to give them maybe a D. Not quite a D-, minus, but now you hear the news that they're gen- benching Jensen for the summer split for quad, and I'm dropping them right down to an F, because that was not the issue at this year's MSI. You're being more generous than I was going to be, man. I was going with an F, maybe F plus on their performance just based off of the only positive we issued out the challenge to them that, you know what? Started your event, you got to beat PSG. Okay, they took that one and then they didn't beat anybody else all the way through is the problem for FlyQuest continuing and that's why it goes down to the F for me. And then you get to F minus with this move on the Jensen one because this is a head scratcher and this is not the move that we wanted to be seeing. I think a lot of people individually would have looked at Wippo and, and Inspired and their performance and lack thereof continuing from the LCS finals into this one and talking about them and how do you, you know, what do you do with those two? Do you reposition it? Do you rework all these other type of things? Nobody was looking at Jensen as one of these issues, one of the problems with this team, why you aren't able to succeed to this, the heights that you know you can set for yourselves. That wasn't it. And for Jensen to take the bullet, to bite the blame on this one, that is not a good look for me. I'm hoping, I'm praying, someone is still out there and there's enough time. Maybe we can get the, him on Dignitas, my man, because you roll a licorice, Jensen, z- Neil's in the bottom lane? That's the full C9 reunion. That absolutely can be and fulfill Dignitas' goals, as they have said, to make it to Worlds this year. I, I, I don't know if there's some behind-the-scenes thing going on with FlyQuest. We know there was a bit of back-and-forth turmoil publicly between Inspired and Jensen, but after one split with this roster, and you could see how mentally boomed and tilted they were at this year's MSI, I wanted them management to step in and talk to the guys and just say, First off, what happened? Why are we tilted? We shouldn't be fighting publicly or talking trash about each other. That's something management needed to address and be like, guys, we're better than this. Run it back for summer. That's what I wanted to see. There were two roads that this FlyQuest failure was going to go down. We talked about it when you know it all happened and they were taking that airplane back to the LCS. It was going on about whether it was going to be the thing that defined you or broke you as a team. Whether this was going to be the moment where you said, all right, enough of of the baloney enough of whatever personal issues we have to be better the expectation individually on ourselves and the community is that we can perform better and that has to be what we showcase out there on the rip and then we're going to come back strong for summer and for the world's run or this was going to be the implosion this was going to be the continued uh, rapid downward trajectory and making a move like this Tells me it is that rapid downward trajectory, even no matter what. And it's unfair to someone like Quad because we can go in and look through him and find reasons to be excited about him to get an opportunity, you know, for, for this FlyQuest team. Right now, this is not the way to get that opportunity. Especially after such a resurgent LCS split where we were talking about Jensen at the top of mid laners tables. It makes absolutely no sense. So real disappointed to see that coming in for summer. As great as it would have been to have NA versus EU, TL versus G2 at MSI, the hype is still better for the G2 T1 rematch. And this time heading into it, I feel like the predictions and how you're feeling about the teams are a whole lot closer than the first time they matched up at this event. G2 has to be the favorites if you're looking at this one. No matter, I don't care how much of a T1 fanboy, myself included, you're looking at the boys and saying that they could be the favorites because it has to be G2 the way that you have seen them level up and take command of their series. That's the biggest one for me. When they step into a series, you know the meta is out the window. You got to be prepared for what G2 establishes the meta for you and for themselves, what they want to play, how they want to play it. These type of things got to be taken into consideration when you're going up against them. You got to cook. You got to come up with something. And we know that T1 can cook. We haven't quite seen the chefs with the ingredients at this event the same way that G2 has brought over that fine European cuisine over to Chengdu. I mean, T1's kind of just been reading other people's recipes or reusing old ones. We get it. Kyrie's great on Orn. He's unkillable. Okay, you get these triple AD carry comps. You got the vein top. You got the Kalista support. But we've seen all this. It's kind of been done before. It's nothing new unlike what we're seeing out of G2. So yeah, even saying G2 
might be favorites coming into this. If you said that before their first matchup, you would have been laughed out of the bank, man. Absolutely. One of the ones, the adaptations you got to see in this series. Number one, Poppy. Poppy is going to be a priority pick for Red. I got to believe both of these squads to be playing. Number one, making sure it's outside of Mickey's hands. That's got to well, be. That's the thing. It's triple flex this pick now, right? And that is the scariest thing, the, the flexibility that she does offer. But you are more so, I think, mostly concerned about it being in that bottom lane, being in the creative a confident and cocky hands of someone like Mickey and the type of plays that he can make for a G2 squad and enable the rest of the teammates to start that snowball as well for G2. For T1, again, talking about it, reading other people's recipes, read Gen G Chovy's recipe for Aurelian Soul. That's the one for me still looking at that one for Faker. We saw it. It wasn't played all that well individually by him, and it certainly wasn't supported throughout the draft and th uh, for both T1 and what the enemy team was able to take into that one. That is one of those angles where I think that you can cook, can bring something different to the table and show us something that is going to catch uh, a squad like G2 off guard. The problem with that being said, if you're going to bring an Aurelian soul into anybody, well, other than Chovy, probably Caps is the worst guy to bring that Aurelian soul into because absolutely we saw that in that individual matchup. He certainly knows every single limitation of this champion and how to get you into those positions. Yeah, he's got the dragon dancing shoes, as we definitely saw in their <laughs> last matchup against T1. But a pick I'm looking at, you saw it hovered in this TL series, the Galio. Another triple flex opportunity. I think this is the series where we get it dropped in. Faker, Galio in China? Faker, yes, Mickey, we might see it multiple lanes. Oh, man. I, I can't believe that we haven't seen that pick. That is absolutely one of those ones that I'm actually disappointed that we haven't seen from any of these teams. It goes beyond just wanting to see it individually. I think that they are missing out on the power and, again, the flexibility that champion can provide at this point. Bring my boy out there. Come on, T1. It's the winner's turn next. Gen G, BLG. We just keep rolling through, pushing through this MSI. But that's it today for League Unlock. Eric and Mark here with you, beauties. Thanks for hanging out, and we will catch you on that flippity flip.